This is Twit. You did launch on Virgin Galactic's Galactic 5 uh, mission on uh, on the Spaceship 2 vehicle, the Unity uh, space plane. Uh, basically, you, 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 bought, you, jumped, you jumped on a rocket plane and you flew into space, Alan, <laughs> and then and then you came back, and and I just think that's amazing and very sci-fi future. And I know it's something that that, as you mentioned, you've been looking forward to both personally mm-hmm. and professionally your whole life. And I just had to ask: Is that as awesome as it sounds? Because it sounds pretty crazy. Yeah, I, I will tell you, uh, Terry. It was uh, the best work day ever. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was. Uh, you know, from our, as a personal experience, uh, from the rocket ride up to space to the time that we were there, um, to the reentry and landing, uh, the camaraderie of the crew, all that uh, uh, was even better than I expected. And then, uh, you know, I went there to do a job mm-hmm. and we had nine separate objectives and all nine got, got accomplished. So I'm, I'm really happy and really proud that we were able to um, to to bat a thousand uh, on my rookie space flight, and I'm looking forward to flying again. Yeah, and and you have additional flights in, like basically on your schedule. You've got like a flight plan for additional science missions. Is that correct? We have one more suborbital flight that I'll be flying with Virgin Galactic. This one will be to perform an experiment that NASA's funding to look at how well the vehicle can do astronomy. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, unmanned rockets, uh, ones called sounding rockets, have been used for decades. Um, but the Virgin Galactic system, and for that matter, the Blue Origin system, are both much less expensive to use. And so it would be a boon for NASA if they can be pressed into the service of astronomy. We already know they can be used for microgravity science. We already know that for human physiology, they're going to be useful. For educators, they're going to be useful. Um, the experiment I'm doing has has to do with um, looking at the same star fields that we looked at with a space shuttle experiment that I was PI of, using the same gear, the space shuttle gear, um, but now doing it from Virgin um, spacecraft to see if there are any differences. If there aren't, then we know that we can do at least as good a job as we could have on the space shuttle, and that'll open up some important avenues of, of new lower-cost research. Yeah, the science. I really want to ask you about that uh, uh, a little bit later in the talk because mm-hmm. it seems like yeah. there's a lot of promise there. I want to know how you can even focus on work when you when you're uh, on on a rocket plane and uh, and then uh, where it could lead the future of science, both on Earth and in space in the future. But how does one book a trip, Alan, on? Uh, Virgin Virgin Galactic, and for our listeners, if 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 you're unaware, Virgin Galactic is a a, a private company. They launch, uh, uh, founded by Sir Richard Branson, they launch uh, uh, the Spaceship Two Unity planes, uh, soon to be a, a new Delta variant that is going to fly a little bit more um, uh, quickly with turnaround to uh, suborbital space and back. Uh, it's piloted by two uh, two pilots, and then you have the the crew members like your like uh, yourself, Alan, uh, who you know strap in for that ride. They get up in the weightless environment. They do their science work or their observations. Uh, I guess you have to get back in to your seats and, and then they come back to Earth and you launch out of a spaceport America in New Mexico. But someone has to buy that ticket. And uh, and I'm just curious, how how did how did this flight happen? Because, uh, you know, there, there's Virgin Galactic was really ramping up uh, to to fly passengers in space, but it's been a long road getting to the part where they can start flying people and someone has to book that trip. Yeah. Well, first I should say that, um, uh, of course I flew as a, as a, as a researcher mm-hmm. and, uh, I'll tell you the story, how we came to, um, purchase the flight, but, uh, uh, the initial reason for developing, uh, the Virgin Galactic system and the Blue Origin system are for space tourists for people who want to go and experience the overview effect and the weightlessness and the rocket ride as a personal experience. And so anyone can go to the websites and um, uh, start the process of, uh, of getting in line to fly. Um, in our case, uh, back in 2009 and 10, uh, at the Southwest Research Institute where I work, it's a firm that's got 3,000 employees based in San Antonio, Texas, but actually with offices. Um, spread around the United States and even uh, uh, across the world. Um, uh, we started a commercial space flight 
uh, suborbital research program. And it was really ahead of its time. Mm -hmm. I'm the principal investigator in that program. And as a part of it, we wanted to gain a competitive advantage in this new era. So uh, we went out and purchased uh, seats for uh, experiments and the experimenter to go with so we could be in the lead in this field. Now, we had a, we, we signed those contracts back in 2011 and 2012. Um, and at the time, we thought we would fly it sooner than 2023, but yeah. it was worth the wait. No question. Uh, and uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, flying along with uh, another researcher named Kelly Girardi mm -hmm. uh, and a space tourist named uh, Ketty Maison Rouge, um, uh, the three of us flew together in the space with those two pilots and with a Virgin uh, trainer and uh, coordinator on board. So the six of us flew to space on November 2nd. Uh, and Kelly and I were there to get work done. And Kenny was there to have a space tourist experience, and uh, it all worked out just great. Well, that, that's amazing. And, uh, and uh, how how much training did you have to get then for that? Because you've been in this field for a while, and we should we should mention that you're no stranger to flying in in, in fast vehicles. I mean, I, I I've seen the images of you in uh, the W fifty seven doing scientific research from high altitude, um, and then I, I learned that you have you were slotted. To fly on the space shuttle, you actually mentioned it a few minutes ago uh, about having an, an experiment there, and um, and then you know that that um, that opportunity was 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 changed. But I didn't even know you you you, you applied to be an astronaut and went through the screening process. Alan, that's amazing to get that far in that 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 selection process. Well, uh, they, I think they started off with uh, close to ten thousand people and ended up selecting about thirty. I was not selected, but I was in the last. A uh, group that went through all the physicals and the psychological exams and so forth. So I got a real good uh, U.S. government physical out of that. <laughs> fairly healthy, um, but was very disappointed not to be selected. Um, regardless, um, you asked about the training. Um, yeah. And let me just say for a space tourist, um, the primary training is uh, just a four-day course in which uh, you're down at Spaceport America in Virgin Galactic um, uh, Get you real familiar with the vehicle and the flight suits and both nominal and off nominal that is emergency procedures uh and they put you in a simulator and you practice 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 uh they take you out in an airplane uh an aerobatic airplane and and uh, uh get you used to uh pulling jeans um and for a tourist i think that's probably about all you need some of the people that also, their tourists want to go fly in a zero G airplane before mm -hmm. that, that's a separate thing you can buy seats on. Um, in my case, as a worker, as a researcher going to space, I wanted to make sure that um, uh, we had the highest possible probability of it working. So we did a lot more training. Of course, I trained with the gear that we developed for the experiments and practiced with that over and over, but I went to centrifuge runs flying the Virgin Galactic launch and entry profiles three different times. Uh, I flew uh, uh, training flights on uh, zero-G airplanes, flew in high-performance F-104 jets to do uh, high-G flying, um, and just practice, 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 so that um, we try to refine the procedures, get familiar with all the sensations, the only thing you can't really simulate is looking out the window <laughs> um, and uh and uh try and take as much of the the um the risk as you can the risk of not performing well and it's in a very compressed amount of time you have to get a lot done you don't get a second shot at it the whole space flight from lift off off the runway to landing on the runway is you know an hour and 15 minutes or a little, a little less actually um the microgravity portion is a little under four minutes. So it's a very compressed timeline, nine objectives. Um, it, it, it was challenging. And so we practiced, 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 and, uh, and it all worked out real well. And just a, a quick follow-up then. So that training, you, you, the Southwest Research Institute organized, and yourself organized that separately then. It wasn't something that was kind of baked into the research scientist flight plan that uh, Virgin Galactic would put together. Is right. That Virgin okay. provided the same four day course that I spoke about earlier. Yeah. In the four okay. days before we flew as a very intensive 
um, bit of training, uh, just like space tourists do. But we, and every time we did a simulation, and we did dozens of them, uh, uh, we practiced the experiment operations um, with a timer uh, to make sure that we could get it all done in the amount of time and that we were getting better and better at it. Um, but the, all the other training that I spoke to is, is uh, training that we undertook at the Southwest Research Institute mm -hmm. because we want to be Cracker Jack at this. It's the yeah. coming era. And uh, this, is, this is really the 21st century now when researchers can fly in space. Uh, just to, to follow up, you know, because uh, we were just talking about the training that you had gone through uh, for the flight. And then you said you had, uh, what, about like 90 minutes, hour, 15 minutes uh, from takeoff to, to, to landing, four minutes uh, of weightlessness. I imagine that's like the sweet spot where your science is going to get done when you're actually in the weightless condition. Some of the science right? was done during ascent and entry because I was wearing a biomedical harness that was taking mm -hmm. data on my react, my physiological reactions throughout um in, in fact from the time that uh, i suited up two hours before the flight until uh after the flight when we got back to the uh the locker room and could you know go back to civilian clothes that's great so and, and i mean and so so that's is that one objective that the biomedical hardness kind of test or and, yeah. and so what what are the other things that you were looking at for this flight and then how did you design the experiment to take advantage of the environment you you knew you'd be in the uh, the primary purpose of the, this flight um was a training and risk reduction uh flight in advance of the nasa flight okay so we took along a mock-up of the experiment gear uh for the nasa experiment i'll be doing on flight two um and we also uh put in a number of training objectives so that we could do we could uh reduce the risk and we partitioned the objectives. There were six that were required to declare success. There were uh, what we call minimum mission success. There were two more that uh, if we got those done, we would call it full mission success. And then we had a ninth objective that's actually a little bit of work relevant to the second flight that we call the get ahead objective. Mm -hmm. And um, and so uh, I wore a biomedical harness. Actually, I wore two different biomedical harnesses. They were collecting information about my blood pressure as a function of time, my respiration rate, my heart rate, et cetera, um, because no one had ever instrumented a researcher on a suborbital flight before. And we wanted to get a database that. And what we hope is that over the years that we'll get a real statistical database of different researchers flying with the same kind of measurements made. So we can see what's typical, but we had to start somewhere. So we started with me. Uh, I was the guinea pig, and then uh, the, all the other objectives had to do with with uh, training for the flight, uh, uh, practicing things with the mock up that we will do on the NASA flight later down the road. Hey, if you enjoyed this clip, be sure to check out this week in space. You can find us on your favorite podcast app, or see the link in the description below. See you there. <laughs>